Good morning. It is Wednesday, June the 2nd, and this is The Drill. Welcome to all the butchers, bakers, and candlestick makers out there. I'm Ron, your host, and the only true conservative in the United States today. So today I'm going to be reading a daily declaration for spiritual warfare. Then we're going to have the Pledge of Allegiance, the uh, Star Spangled Banner, and then after that I'm going to be reading an article from American Conservative Magazine, and then uh, I'm going to have some commentary. Loose yourself from darkness. I have given you the power to loose yourself from any control in darkness. My power and authority in your life will enable you to deliver yourself from the control of the enemy. Follow the instructions of my word and awake. Awake. Put on your strength and your beautiful garments of salvation and shake yourself from the dust of the enemy's power. Loose yourself from the bonds the enemy has placed around your neck and be a captive to the enemy's evil control no longer. I will show myself faithful to you and will keep your lamp burning. I will turn your darkness into light. Know that with my help you can advance against a troop of the enemy's demons, for I have armed you with strength to be victorious. Prayer Declaration The Lord has rewarded me according to his righteousness in me and according to the cleanness of my hands in his sight. He has shown himself faithful to me. He will keep my lamp burning and will turn my darkness into light. He is my shield, and he arms me with his strength. He gave me his shield of victory, and his right hand sustains me. Amen. And that was the um, daily declaration for spiritual warfare. And again, I like to um, I like the daily declarations for spiritual warfare because they remind me that uh, this is a battle between right and left in this country that goes deeper, and it's fundamentally about good and evil. So um, right now, uh, we're going to do the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. And now, the Star Spangled Banner. Thank you, thank you. That is gorgeous. And um, I read or I play the uh, Pledge of Allegiance and the Star Spangled Banner because I want to be reminded that part of a significant part of being a conservative is being patriotic. When I come back, I'm going to be reading an article from American Conservative magazine called The Fourth Republic.
Thank you, thank you. The Fourth Republic, a, a timely proposal for an amicable divorce. And it's uh, written by William S. Lind. Okay, so the United States of America is heading for divorce court. Our land now hosts two different hostile cultures, both of which are rapidly coming to the conclusion that their differences are irreconcilable, as indeed they are. The woke culture of the coastal elites hates the traditional Western Judeo-Christian culture of the heartland, and the latter correctly sees a mortal threat in the cultural Marxism that underlies the worldview of the elites. The question now is whether the divorce can be amicable. On that depends the long-term future of both parties. If it turns nasty, the Federal Union will dissolve into widespread fourth-generation war. War like that we see in Libya, Syria, and Iraq. War with massive destruction and potentially millions of deaths. It is in the interest of both cultural Marxists and cultural conservatives to maintain some sort of union for domestic peace and tranquility, foreign policy, national defense, and macroeconomics. The solution is what I call the Fourth American Republic. The First Republic was the Confederation. The Second ran from the ratification of the Constitution to the Civil War. In that Second Republic, the federal government was weak, as the founders intended. Most decisions were made at the state level, and there was no notion that life in every state should be the same, much less that the federal government had the authority to make them the same. The Third Republic began after the Civil War and is now coming to an end. In it, the power of the federal government grew to the point where it encompassed everything, right down to dictating what sort of shower heads and toilets Americans had in their bathrooms. The Fourth Republic, as I envision it, would be much like the Second. The federal government would be restricted to foreign policy, defense, and macroeconomics. Once again, most matters would be determined at the state level, and life in one state it would become very different from life in another. The difference is the key to holding the Union together. We would have left-wing states and right-wing states. The former would be run by cultural Marxists and the latter by cultural conservatives. We would get to see which works better over time. Hint, look at California, then Ohio. If someone did not like being governed by people he detested, he would move. Once again, as In, say, 1850, life in Massachusetts would be very different from life in Alabama. Not only would the Fourth Republic offer both left and right the advantages of union, including the non-trivial advantage of avoiding civil war, we can bring it about by entirely non-violent legal means. My proposal for doing so is a constitutional amendment with two parts. The first would repeal all other amendments passed after the 13th, which abolished slavery. The second would receive the uh, commerce uh, would revise the commerce clause, which now gives Congress the power to quote regulate commerce with foreign nations and among the several states and with the Indian tribes unquote uh, quote among the several states unquote would be stricken. Most of the federal government's vast power grab um, under the Third Republic depends for its legality and justification on either the Commerce Clause or amendments passed after the 13th. Assuming we retain a Supreme Court that interprets law rather than making it, the amendment I propose would knock the props out from under almost all federal government's uh, arrogated powers. The Fourth Republic uh, would remain, uh, that would remain, would be a union of largely independent states, and most people would again come to give their primary loyalty to their state as they did before 1861. They might shake their head at the folly of neighboring states, but they would see no need to take up arms against it. In such a course politically, is such a course politically possible? Clearly, with the left in control of both houses of Congress, an amendment like I have proposed would go nowhere. But the Constitution offers another route. If two-thirds of the states propose an amendment uh, or amendments, Congress must call a constitutional convention. Before that happened, even a Democratic Congress would probably see the light, since the outcomes of a convention would be unpredictable. Republicans control enough state legislatures to get the amendment process going now and give it a good head of steam. We don't have to wait for a miracle. 
An amicable divorce is only possible with both parties want one. I think most cultural conservatives would be willing to see the left run the West Coast and Northeast so long as we ended up with most of the rest of the country as we would. I'm less optimistic about the cultural Marxists. Like all ideologues, if they allow anyone to escape their clutches, they open themselves to charges of impurity from even more radical people, even more radical than themselves. Nor, knowing nothing of war, do they feel any urgency in preventing widespread fourth-generation war here with all the misery it entails. But if it comes to that, after conservatives have made the effort for peaceful legal separation, we will hold the moral high ground which is the most advantageous position from which to launch a campaign. So that was The Fourth Republic by William S. Lind, uh, who, let's look at the bio here. Uh, he wrote a book with Lieutenant Colonel uh, Gregory uh, Thide um, of, uh, called The Fourth Generation Warfare Handbook. And um, Lind's most recent book is Retroculture, Taking America Back. I think I uh, have a copy of that in my kindle library but anyways uh, my comment on that uh, as a matter of fact um, what i'm going to do here is uh, make the comment when i come back thank you thank you so uh again about uh, william s lynn's um article he is falling into the he's being influenced by the left with this idea Um, the left always starts with the presumption for change and that's what he's doing he sees he creates an excuse for change he says that america is uh, going through a divorce and the question is whether or not it's going to be violent or amicable and um, it's a nice little uh, slogan it's uh, an interesting metaphor but it has no basis in reality. It's just used as a way of setting up the article and setting up the idea for him to make, uh, agree with, and basically make radical changes to this country, revolutionary changes, getting rid of three amendments in one swoop and basically ending up with the kind of country that we had before the Civil War where um, you had half of the country that was non-slave and the other half of the country that was slavery is ridiculous on its face. Um, He does not make the case for change. He just presumes that, uh, again, because of some uh, uh, fantasy that he has about, uh, or a a metaphor, this uh, divorce metaphor, that is absolutely necessary. The other thing is that even if he could convince me or anyone else that this kind of wholesale change was necessary, it's a stupid idea anyways because the left will simply subvert it. This is what the left wants. They want revolutionary change, and they're looking for allies in that effort. They don't care where those allies come from. This is why they're squishy about Muslim or Islamic terrorism. Okay. Uh, on the one hand, they're ambivalent. They love Islamic terrorism because it, they see the, the um, revolutionary potential of Islamic terrorism. They hate it because that uh, revolutionary potential is religious in nature. So, but they will um, buddy up with the Islamic terrorists as long as they think it's going to get them a revolution. Because, again, they don't care when or where or who starts the revolution so long as they get one. And what uh, Mr. Lind is proposing here is a revolution in this country. He's just proposing that we do it by nonviolent means, which is uh, all the, you know, fine by the left. They don't care so long as they get their revolution. Now, what will happen is if we end up with a constitutional convention is the left will lie, cheat, and steal to run that convention and turn the United States of America into the People's Republic of America, turn it into China, turn it into the former Soviet Union. I know this with absolute certainty because it's exactly what has happened in the state of California. The reason that the state is run by solidly by the left and that the right has absolutely no say is because we did... Um, uh, gerrymandering. We It used to be in the state of California that gerrymandering was left to the politicians. It was given to the, um, uh, the legislature to go ahead and drop the districts. So then we passed a 
law, and it was a, a not a referendum, but an initiative, a ballot initiative, the people said, enough of this. We're not going to have the politicians do this anymore. We, the people, are going to draw the districts. So they found it, found uh, created a district commission, and there was rules and this, that, and the other thing. And the first thing that the left did was they subverted it. They cheated. They loaded up, because this is supposed to be, again, a... Uh, basically balanced. You get people from very, various different walks of life. Maybe even you would do it um, uh, to create this commission on, um, since it was going to be, um, this commission would be done every 10 years, I guess, then you would uh, just pick people randomly from um, the population and go from there. But the left cheated. They uh, loaded up the commission with lefties. And the lefties drew the districts in such a way so as we end up with all lefty candidates and lefty office holders, and everybody else is out. And so this is how we end up with feces on the street. This is how we end up with needles on the street. This is how we end up with a state that is being run by criminals, literally and figuratively. And if we want to turn the United States of America into uh, 50 Californias, then the best way to do that is to have a constitutional convention where the left will uh, cheat their ass off. Because once they see that opportunity, a constitutional convention is a great opportunity for anybody who does not want to act in good faith to lie, cheat, and steal to gain power. And they will do it. So his idea is uh, wrong on two counts. Number one, we don't need it. No, no such change is necessary. Fine, things are fine the way they are. But thank you very much, Mr. Lind. Second, if we're going to have some type of revolutionary change, a constitutional convention is probably the worst idea. Back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. And uh, now another article from the uh, American Conservative magazine, and it's called Trump's Hispanic Bump by Santi Ruiz and Lars Schonander. I should have just skipped the names on that. But anyways, there's no political question as consistently in vogue among a certain class of conservative intellectuals as, quote, why aren't Hispanics more conservative, unquote. The perennial springs uh, up every election cycle. In 2012, after the painful defeat of John McCain, the accepted wisdom was that Hispanics needed to be pursued through moderation on immigration. If Hispanic Americans perceive that the GOP nominee or candidate does not want them in the United States, they will not pay attention to our next sentence, stated the post-election autopsy produced by the Republican National Committee in 2013. But the swing among Hispanic Americans toward Trump in 2020 was unexpected by most and has therefore been dissected especially vigorously. The regnant wisdom today, to the extent there is one, is that Trump turbocharged the GOP's turn to become a multi-ethnic workers' party. In this telling, Trump uh, bled white suburbanites, but his gains among ethnic minorities suggested the GOP had done something right, perhaps a more muscular fight against traditional elites. It's a compelling narrative that continues uh, that contains some truth. The trend toward the GOP in 2020, a surprise for those who thought Trump was a political toxin, suggests we have lessons to learn. But those lessons are complicated, and the nature of Hispanic voting patterns in the 2020 election means that national-level explanations for the swing may be insufficient. The more one digs into the data, the more one finds difficulty in describing Hispanic voters as a block at all. Take Texas. Aggregating data from the New York Times and local precincts, we see the major Hispanic shift that uh, wowed pundits on election night and beyond. Yet the shift in Texas was heavily localized, hitting places like Star County along the Rio Grande and largely dissipating in counties farther north of the border. Um, Notably, Hispanic voters shifted harder toward Trump in more Hispanic counties. 
Star County, deep red at the bottom, voted nearly 30% more Republican in 2020 than 2016. By contrast, the mean shift in vote from 2016 to 2020 in Texas Hispanic majority counties was 7.5%. The graph shows a clear pattern. Rio Grande counties in, um, excuse me, and those in Texas' southern tip swung by more than 10%, while East Texas Hispanics shifted less. But while the GOP gained uh, these voters, it lost votes in places where more people live. Examples abound. Big suburbs like Tarrant County voted for Trump in 2016, but not in 2020. Outside of the Rio Grande Valley, non-Hispanic majority counties shifted toward Biden, enough to give Biden a gain of about four points on Clinton's performance. Grand election narratives may be under overdetermined, uh, but Biden gained with suburban moms, Trump gained with POC workers, broadly describes the Texas story. What motivated Hispanic voters? Polls during the run-up to the general election from Texas Politics Project shed some insight on how Hispanic voters, uh, Democrat and Republican, saw major issues in the race. While there are some commonalities, the percentage of each group, group holding these issues is very different. A quarter of Hispanic Democrats viewed COVID-19 as the most important issue versus 15% of Hispanic Republicans. It's striking how similar Texas Hispanic Republicans are in their top priorities. On the national level, they're concerned about the media, abortion, and general moral decline. On the local level, immigration and border security are both present. Here we go. The divergences among Hispanic and other Republicans give us a general sense of what worked best for capturing Hispanic voters. These voters cared substantially less about federal spending, the debt, political corruption, but cared more about the economy. Unfortunately, these polls don't break down by region, but we can intuit some takeaways. Traditional GOP um, bugbears, such as the deficit or national security, aren't concerns among these Hispanic Republicans, but not border border security. Much like their non-Hispanic co-partisans, they're concerned about the media, the economy, the immigration policy, with the economy chief among those issues. Notably, Hispanic Republicans became especially interested in economic issues over the summer. If there's one constant takeaway through the data, it's that these voters were energized by the debate lockdowns amid the pandemic. By contrast, voters already in the Democratic column barely moved over the course of the summer. Reopening became a highly motivating issue for one side, but not the other. The swing toward Trump in Miami was somewhat better understood in traditional media. uh, Crypto-con Matthew uh, Iglesias accurately pointed out in Vox the city's deep emotional and intellectual investments in the Latin American Cold War. Politico expressed concern that the memes and disinformation were being trafficked to Florida Hispanic communities in WhatsApp groups and quoted locals who claimed that they were centrally coordinated. The concern was at least partially founded. The Trump campaign invested deeply in organic messaging to uh, Miami's Hispanic communities. Far from simply focusing on Cuban voters, the campaign uh, emphasized issues that mattered to a wide range of uh, constituencies. Countering dictatorship to Venezuela, cultural war issues, uh, cultural war issues to evangelical, evangelical Latinos, and economic reopening across the board. Some analysts believe Trump won half of all non Cuban Hispanics there. In Texas, the same pattern emerged. Trump did best among the communities his campaign reached out to directly uh, invest in and in areas where his administration clearly improved the working lives of voters. In at least the Texas case, Trump really did grow the pie, bringing in voters who generally didn't come to the polls. An Equus postmortem analysis found that swing votes in the Rio Grande uh, Valley were especially likely to be non-regular voters which makes the GOP's lack of outreach to Hispanic voters in other cases all the more mystifying. In Georgia, Hispanics are more than 10% of the population. Biden's vote margin among Hispanics was about 60,000 more than John Ossoff's margin in November, meaning Republicans had a unique opportunity to peel away Democrat voters skeptical of the Senate nominee. Hispanic-majority counties that border Mexico shifted more towards Trump than those not on the border. The 2013 GOP autopsy was correct in one sense. Hispanic voters are there to be won. 
We can't draw a straight line from the GOP gains with Hispanics to its losses in largely white suburbs. Um, elections are strategically rare enough to deny definitive explanations to armchair pundits. So the intra-conservative debate will continue. One pat interpretation of the above was um, offered by liberal media on the night of the election and has seeped into public consciousness since racial minorities vote for Trump as they become more culturally white. Latino is a contrived ethnic category that artificially lumps white Cubans with black Puerto Ricans and indigenous Guatemalans and helps explain why Latinos support Trump at the second highest rate which suggests that perhaps Hispanic racial identity is so amorphous as to be of limited usefulness in electioneering for Republicans. The Trump team increased its support in Hispanic communities by speaking directly to them and by emphasizing issues important to those communities. That approach, not any racialized appeal, is the way forward. So, and that was uh, an article about the... um, about uh, Trump and why it is that he, and their analysis about why it is that Trump um, did so well with Hispanics. And uh, back in a minute. Thank you, thank you. That brings me to the conclusion of another episode of The Drill. And until next time, uh, be honest, be smart, be beautiful, and remember that the left has no authority, no power, and they can't win.